Hi, I'm Shannon Wyman, Scientific Communications Manager at Keystone Symposia, and I'm here today to discuss the upcoming Neurocircuitry of Social Behavior meeting with meeting co-organizer Dr. Helen Hu of Zhejiang University, China. Dr. Hu, thank you for joining me today. First, can you tell us a little about your research and expertise? So thank you, Shannon. Pleasure to join the discussion. So research in my lab uh, is largely concerned with emotional and social behaviors. And we are interested in understanding how these behaviors are encoded in the brain and how they may be share, uh, shaped by experience um, through plastic changes in relevant neural circuits. So in particular, we are focusing on social hierarchy and depression. Depression is a huge problem worldwide. Many of our listeners may be experiencing it or have family and friends experiencing it. What can you tell us about how depression dysregulates social behaviors and why? So impairment in social behaviors is one of the major symptoms of depression. So impairments may include withdrawal from social interactions, avoidance of social competitions, reduced empathy and impaired uh, emotional recognition. So one of the reasons behind uh, this impairment is thought to be um, thought to lie in the deficit in the social reward circuits. Very interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about those deficits? What, how does how do social reward circuits typically operate, and what goes wrong with depressed patients? Okay. So social reward is this positive feeling that we get when we interact with people. So one of our speakers, Robert Malenker, and his colleague, uh, Gao Dulin, have done some really interesting studies showing that mice also prefer social interactions over isolation, just like humans. They also showed that uh, a general reward circuit downstream of the dopamine neurons also encodes this social reward. Um, in their model, serotonin released into the circuit is critical in regulating the activity of the circuits. And we know that in depression, serotonin and dopamine are dysregulated. So this may um, impair the circuit in a way that would diminish uh, the pleasure associated with social interactions, causing social withdrawal or even social aversion. Oh, very interesting. How does social stress contribute to depression? in behavioral aspect as well as on that level of neurocircuitry. Right, uh, so social stress is also a topic that we will cover in this Keystone meeting. So the social stressors may include social isolation, social defeat, early life social deprivation, being low in social hierarchy, or sometimes being on top of the social hierarchy, or loss of social status. So these are all type of uh, social stressors that we may encounter in daily life. So some studies have begun to look into uh, how these different stresses may affect uh, the social reward circuit. For example, uh, Ari Nestler's group uses this social defeat model in which they make mouse being bullied by a very aggressive, very aggressive mouse every day for 10 days. And they found afterwards the dopamine neuron um, becomes dysregulated in the reward circuit and they can also rescue this depressive-like phenotype by fixing the problem of the dopamine neurons. Looking a little bit deeper into that um, learned helplessness versus resilience as it relates to depression. Um, for example, in rodents, animals with depression will give up in the face of adversity before their non-depressed counterparts. Why is this and why are some people able to fight through adversity seemingly endlessly while others with depression are mentally defeated so quickly? So um, the concept of learned helplessness was initially developed in animal psychology by Martin Salomon and Steve, Stephen Mayer. So they found that when animals are repeatedly exposed to an aversive stimuli without the choice of escape, they may develop and helpless and become, uh, they may stop trying eventually, uh, stop to trying to escape eventually, even though when the opportunities of escape may become available later, some of these animals will um, just completely give up and stop trying. 
So um, this sense of absence of control is a core symptom in clinical depression. On the other hand, some other animals, they may uh, keep trying and do not give up in adversity, even though they have been exposed to the same amount of stress. So this resilience, um, so that is resilience. So this individual difference in resilience versus susceptibility to depression um, is a fascinating problem. Uh, there are growing efforts now looking into this. And again, Ari, uh, Eric Nessler is a lead, leading expert on this topic. So in their social defeat model, they found some mice uh, natural resilience. So they will remain normal uh, no matter how badly they are being uh, bullied. Mm. Um, so strikingly, when they examined their gene expression of these resilient mice, they found uh, that they have a, an additional set of uh, change in their gene expression. Uh, even though phenotypically they may uh, compare with the susceptible animals, they may appear uh, less or having no phenotype. So actually they have this additional set of gene change that may help them to cope with the stress. So on this topic, one of my uh, co-organizers, um, Carmen Sandy, also have a very interesting study showing that hierarchical status in mice may predict vulnerability to stress. And surprisingly, she, she found that, that mice on, top, on the top of this, uh, the rank may actually be uh, more vulnerable. I think she may talk about this in the Keystone meeting. Or the interesting. Do those mechanisms have to do with the neurotransmitters or the circuits underneath, or is there any? Um... It, also have, it also have to do with the social reward circuit I just mentioned mm. are involving dopamine neurons and their downstream target region. Looking at treatments for depression, whether they're SSRIs, cognitive behavioral mm. therapy, electroshock treatments, um, all different approaches, how do these interventions impact these circuits and what do these new discoveries about these social reward circuits and social neurocircuitry tell us about how we're currently treating depression and what new approaches we might take in the future? So a recent work from my own group actually uh, deals with this question. So we focus on a relatively new but highly promising antidepressant drug called ketamine. So in contrast to the classical SSI type of antidepressant, for example, ketamine can take effect very rapidly, often within hours, but it may also be addictive. So it will be uh, really nice to understand the mechanism behind how ketamine works. So in our work, we found uh, ketamine antagonizes this anti-reward center in the brain. So in depression, the activity of this anti-reward center goes up and they may uh, go on to suppress the reward circuits hmm. and, and downregulate dopamine level or serotonin level. So with ketamine's action, it will actually quench the activity of this anti-reward center, therefore disinhibiting or taking off the break onto this reward circuit to rapidly uh, improve moods. So through this work, we identified several molecules that may be uh, that can regulate the activity of this anti-reward center, mm. and they may provide promising targets for um, new antidepressant treatments. Oh wow, interesting! So are those molecules then downstream of what ketamine does, or are they based on the ketamine structure? So one of these molecule is actually a molecular, a major uh, target that will be blocked by ketamine, which is an end okay. uh, of glutamate receptor. Okay. Yeah. It was actually initially uh, discovered kind of accidentally in patients mm -hmm. uh, about 20 years ago, but many clinical trials have been followed. And indeed, just in March this year, FDA has just approved uh, the S-ketamine, which is an isoform of ketamine by Johnson & Johnson, uh, to go uh, to to go on the market, so now it's available. The nasal uh, spray uh, spraying form of ketamine is now. Oh, available. is that what the nasal spray? I've I've heard yeah. of that. Very interesting. Is that one less addictive, or is that still a problem, potential problem? I think the addictive property is still under investigation, but hopefully the S form may be less addictive compared with, uh, for example, the R form. Mm -hmm. or the of the both uh, isoforms. So the other um, kind of really cool nature uh, feature of ketamine is 
been uh, to have a sustained quite long lasting effect. So in humans with infusion of ketamine, um, the effect can last up to one week, even though uh, the, uh, the drug itself may metabolize very quickly. So within several mm -hmm. hours, um, there's only half of drug left. So that suggests that there are some neural mechanisms supporting this sustained effect of the drug. Mm -hmm. This is also an area that we are actively looking into, trying to understand why the effect can last so long. Wow, that's great. As we discussed, social hierarchy, dominance, aggression, um, these all play major roles in our society. And whether we're talking about politics, international relations, domestic violence, or other criminal activities, how does our neurocircuitry dictate these central human drivers? Right. Um, so thank you for bringing up this topic. So we will have a session on social hierarchy and aggression and a session on empathy in this Keystone meeting. Um, in terms of social hierarchy, we can appreciate that it is not only affected by animals' body size or brute strength, but also critically depend on personality traits such as confidence or grit. So these traits are under the control of high cortical function. So in this meeting, I will uh, talk about a neural circuit in mice involving the, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex uh, that controls the dominance behavior. Hmm. In terms of aggression, Dr. David Anderson will discuss his fascinating work on how aggression may be regulated at the molecular and circuitry level in the hypothalamus. And these behaviors uh, and mechanisms are highly conserved throughout evolution. So Dr. Hitoshi Okamoto will talk about these dramatic fights in fish and a conserved neural circuit regulating these fish fights. The relationship of social hierarchy and empathy is also an interesting question. So are alpha males more or less empathetic? So I think Dr. Hisab Shin may be the right person to answer that. So Dr. Shin is also one of the co-organizers of this meeting and he's a world leader on animal models of empathy. So um, he had discovered that a neural pathway in empathy also involving the medial prefrontal cortex. So we may hear how these two behavioral traits uh, interact from Dr. Shin in this meeting. Interesting, yeah, because empathy and aggression seem to be counterbalancing each other and how do we decide which behavior to take? Interesting. Yes. Um, so how will this conference help to progress the field? And what do you think this meeting will accomplish that others have not? What's going to be unique about this meeting in its ability to move these discoveries forward, both scientifically and translationally? So to my knowledge, uh, this meeting is the very first one on the topic of social neuroscience in the Keystone meeting series. Uh, it may also be the first of its kind in meetings of the same caliber, including garden conferences and Cold Spring Harbor meetings. So um, as more behavioral paradigms and more tools for behavioral analysis are becoming available, um, I believe now is a golden time to study social neuroscience. And such a meeting is timely and we are super excited to uh, bring together top leaders in the field. Um, this will uh, be an op uh, unique opportunity for scientists of the same interest to interact, to brainstorm, and hopefully will uh, come up with new ideas and directions that will move the field forward. Well, great. Thank you so much for your time today, and we very much look forward to learning more at the meeting. Hey, thank you, Shannon. Looking forward.